Hi, my name is Mark Smith, N6MTS. Um, I'm also known as Smitty Halibut on Twitter and various other locations. Um, I'm going to be presenting today on an appliance for FM satellites, operating FM satellites. Uh, I recently uh, became the president and CEO of Halibut Electronics Incorporated, although that feels a little pre pretentious, so I'm going to stick with head cheese, maybe big honcho. I don't know. We'll get back to you on that one. Anyway, Halibut Electronics is also on Twitter at Halibut Elec, uh, or HTTPS colon slash slash electronics.halibut.com. Let's go talk about that appliance for operating FM satellites, shall we? Ooh, what's that? Okay, let's move on. So why are operating FM satellites a challenge? What is the problem we're trying to solve here? Well, when you operate an FM satellite, you often want to be able to talk and hear, talk to and hear from the satellite at the same time. You need to operate at full duplex. You're going to be transmitting on VHF and listening on UHF or the other way around, depending on which satellite. And there are a lot of radios that do that now. Most mobile rigs will do full duplex uh, cross band. Uh, the uh, you know the big base station rigs like the ICOM 9700 will do that, uh, but those are big and heavy um, and uh, um, you know require a lot of power. They're not great for portable use. There used to be HTs that were sold that did full duplex, like the venerable Kenwood D72 is probably the most recent one. In the old days, the Yesu FT430, I think, was the one. But nobody makes an HT that will do full duplex operation, cross-band full duplex anymore. Uh, they don't exist. And so you either have to use a bigger radio, like a mobile rig or a, a base station rig, or try to find a old HT that are becoming unobtainium because everybody's got them for satellite work, or you hack together something with multiple HTs, and now you're transmitting on one but listening to the other, um, and you want like all of the, you need to be able to adjust the frequencies at the same time. We'll talk about Doppler shift in a little bit. It's just kind of a kludge, right? There, there's, there's no good solution for a full duplex radio right now. Uh, we talked a little bit about Doppler. There's a lot of math that happens when you're operating with a satellite. Um, things like you want to be able to know when the satellite is going to come up in your sky. Um, there are a lot of apps that do this. Uh, you can get them on your phone or a tablet or a computer that you say, this is the location where I'm going to be, or if you know, it's on your phone, you've got a GPS in there, uh, and it knows where the satellites are because that data is available on the internet, and it can do that pass prediction. But that's another device. It would be nice if we had that all in one place. Similarly, Doppler shift. Um, as the satellite's coming up over the horizon, it's moving toward you really fast. And so that compresses the RF and raises the frequency of uh, the signals between you and the satellite. Similarly, when it's going away from you, uh, when it's setting behind you, it's got you know the the waves are getting stretched apart. Doppler shift, and so you've got to have a you got to be above the frequency when it's coming toward you, and below the frequency when it's going away from you. And yet you need to be able to adjust that as it's going across the sky. Similarly. You need to know where it is in the sky if you're going to point a directional antenna at it, like a handheld arrow, uh, you know, small Yagi antenna. You need to know the azimuth and elevation. Azimuth is kind of the compass heading, and elevation is how far up over the horizon is it. Um, this is all math. This can be done, and there are programs that do this, but there aren't any radios that do this. And so, yet again, you've got another device that you're having to watch while the satellite pass is happening. Um, what about audio? So we talked earlier about the um, having a uh, you know one or two radios. If you're trying to do HTs, you need to have two radios, and you got to get that audio into one place. And for me personally, I like having a headset, so my hands are free. I don't have to hold a speaker phone or a speaker in my hand. Um, so I want to be able to route everything up to a headset. Um, and so there's just a bunch of audio routing that has to that has to be done um, for the uh, oops wrong way audio routing to headsets for the next thing we, we want to be able to record. 
the pass. Um, because as the satellite's going overhead, you've already got your hand, one hand holding the antenna. You've got another hand tuning the, the tuning knob. You got your third hand on your speaker mic, the push to talk. And then you've got your fourth hand trying to write down logs on the notepad that you're holding with your fifth hand, right? You're just running out of hands it, and it, it, it gets very complex. So a common thing for people to do is to record the audio of the pass, um, and if you're trying to rig up a audio interface between the radios and your headset and then to the recorder and all, you know, like that's, it's just, you got a lot of stuff that you need to hack together. There isn't one ideal radio that you can buy to do this, right? So what would that ideal radio look like? What is that ideal appliance for operating FM satellites looked like. Well, it's something that does all of those things. Uh, that was an easy slide. Enter SOAR, Satellite Optimized Amateur Radio. This is a product I've been working on for the last few months. Um, if you're a listener of the Ham Radio Workbench podcast, you've heard me talking about the Secret Squirrel project. That's what this is. This is the Secret Squirrel. It is a satellite optimized amateur radio. This picture here is of one of the prototypes that I'm that I've been playing with. So what does SOAR do? Well, it does the first thing it addresses is the full duplex VHF UHF. I want to make a radio that you can buy now for inexpensive um, that have separate VHF and UHF radio modules that can in operate completely independently of each other and then put a bandpass filter on those so that there's no desense. When you're transmitting on one, it doesn't desense the receiver on the other one. So you can transmit and receive at the same time. Similarly, it's got a microcontroller in it. Right now it's a Teensy 4.1, incredibly powerful microcontroller, 600 megahertz, 32-bit uh, processor. I mean, this is, this is way more powerful than some of the servers I've had, you know, just a decade or two ago, right? Um, so we, we got plenty of horsepower to do a lot of math. The radio has a GPS built into it, so it knows where it is and it knows when it is. Those are two very important things. To that, you add the satellite TLE data. TLE stands for two-line elements. It's a string of numbers that you can plug into an algorithm, a string of number that describes where a satellite is in the sky um, and how to calculate, well, excuse me, it describes its orbit. And then you can use the TLEs and the time to know exactly where the satellite is at any given time. And if you know where the satellite is and you know where you are, and you know what time it is, then you can automatically calculate, and more importantly, SOAR automatically calculates. You can calculate the AOS and LOS times, so the acquisition of signal and loss of signal times. When is the satellite going to come up over the horizon, and when is it going to drop down over the horizon? You can make a prediction of when a satellite is going to be, be there. You can also calculate, you know, what's its maximum elevation, where on the horizon is it going to be, all those kinds of things. All the standard things that a satellite prediction software does, SOAR can do. It can also calculate relative velocity while the satellite is overhead. Uh, and it uses that relative velocity to adjust the frequency of the radio and account for Doppler shift automatically. Right. So you don't have to keep a hand on the, the, the channel knobs or the frequency knobs for your radio. All of this is built in with some of the bigger radios. You can hook up a computer, ex an external computer to the radio to control it for you. Um, but you can't do that. I've never seen an HT that has that kind of control. Maybe they're out there, but even if they are you now have another computer, another device that you have to carry around with you and another cable and all that fun stuff. Again, I'm trying to make an appliance. So SOAR, the built-in microcontroller, will automatically calculate the uh, relative velocity and adjust the receiver and transmitters for Doppler shift. While we're at it, let's calculate the azimuth and elevation and display those on the screen. So we'll have a, um, you know, the circular sky plot that shows the azimuth and elevation of where the satellite is at any given time. All right, audio. Uh, SOAR is optimized for headset use. I realize that not everyone may want to use a headset and... Um, 
and so you can you can rig up a thing that will plug it into a speaker if you prefer, and then a hand mic if you prefer. But I prefer a headset, uh, and so it is designed for you know a four pin, three point five millimeter TRRS headset, like a standard PC gaming headset, if you will. Right, left audio, right audio, ground, and microphone. Um, and the grounded microphone can be reversed because there are two different standards. The great thing about standards, there's so many to choose from. It will work on either one. Um, and so the headset sends audio. You just plug the headset directly into SOAR, and it sends all of the raw audio to the right place. What are all those right places? Well, obviously, it will pass it to the radios itself, but it will also take the audio from the radio and record it into one channel, and it will take the audio from your microphone and record it into another channel. And so we can record all of the audio from the satellite pass onto its internal storage. Spoiler, the internal storage is just an SD card. Uh, but you'll be able to get to that internal storage when you plug the radio into a computer over a USB cable. It'll show up like a mass storage device on USB, and you can get to that audio from there. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. That audio can either be played back directly on SOAR, uh, or it can be available as a web as a wave file over the USB. You plug the radio into the computer over USB and it shows up like a mass storage device with a bunch of wave files on it. All right, what about other controls? Uh, well, the obvious one is a PTT. We need a PTT. There is a socket on the radio for just a simple contact closure for a push to talk. Uh, my intention is to run that up to a cable, run that through a cable up to the boom of the antenna. I've got an arrow antenna, and I suspect most people have an arrow antenna or a similar handheld antenna, and strap a PTT button onto the antenna boom itself. Since I've already got that hand holding the boom, I you know should be right there to hit a PTT. I'm working on that design. I don't have anything to announce yet. Actually, a friend of mine is working on that design, AK6DM, Dan. Um, we're probably just going to release that as a 3D print file that you can make them on your own. Uh, we'll see about whether I get into the business of selling that. I kind of don't want to get into the business of selling 3D printed stuff, so we'll probably just make that available for people to print or have fabbed somewhere else. But... We can mount a PTT button on the antenna boom. If you prefer, you can have the PTT through any other mechanism you want. If you'd rather it be a handheld switch or a foot switch or an elbow switch, I don't know, whatever you want it to be, you can do whatever you want. We are also going to be exposing the azimuth and elevation information uh, through a serial port on that same connector. And the idea is that you can run that serial data up through that cable to the boom of the, of the antenna and make a little targeting display. Maybe you make a tiny computer with a display that has a magnetometer and an accelerometer in it. And by you, I mean me. We'll get to that. Have a little targeting display on the, on the boom. If the boom knows where down is, and it knows where north is, and it knows what azimuth and elevation, what compass heading and how far above the horizon the satellite is at any given time, you take the difference between those two vectors, and now I can say you need to move you know, move your antenna up a little bit more or a little bit more over to the left or whatever, and it can help you point that antenna toward the satellite. That's something I'm thinking about. Um, all right. So what does the radio itself look like? How is the radio going to work? Because there aren't any radios that do this sort of thing uh, currently, so we need to find... We, you know, we need to design a user interface for that. And that's what's been taking me the most amount of time, honestly. There are four primary operating modes that this radio will be in. I've got a couple of other views that will that I won't be talking about here, but there, there are four primary ones that are interesting. The first one is as a standard HT, right? Sometimes you just need to talk to your friends on the repeater. Okay, fine. We're going to put that in there. So it operates like a normal HT. You got channels, you got, um, you know, memory channels or a VFO mode. You got a transmit and, uh, um, I'm sorry, a receive frequency and an offset for your transmit. Uh, CTCSS tones, low and high power. Uh, you can adjust the squelch. You can adjust the volume. All the things that you would expect out of an HT, both VFO and memory modes. We also have, will have a pass prediction mode, and this is going to be like the app on your phone, the GoSat Watch or whatever app you end up using. Um, I haven't designed this yet, so I don't have anything to show for it, uh, but it's, it's one of the planned 
uh, uh, modes of operation. It will be able to say, you know, give you a list of satellites and say, these are all the satellites I know. You say, I want to know that one from where I'm at now or give it a different uh, latitude and longitude and a time or whatever. And it will tell you what all the passes are in that time range from that location for that satellite. And it and can give you all of that information. Then, of course, there's also the pass operation view. Um, when the satellite is above is above you, you need to be able to operate it, right? So we want to do all the Doppler offsetting. Um, we want to see the sky track, um, uh, you know, the azimuth and elevation and all that fun stuff. So again, here, the, the different satellites are, show up as channels in the memory bank. So it already knows the, um, you know, the center downlink frequency and uplink frequency. It is able to calculate the Doppler offsets for those frequencies, you know, minus on one side, positive on the other, and it applies those automatically, and that shows up here as the, as the actual transmit and receive frequencies. It displays the current azimuth and elevation, both numerically and through the sky chart. Um, you can uh, adjust the squelch manually, but when acquisition of signal happens, it automatically drops the squelch down to zero, so it opens up the squelch automatically when it thinks the bird's in the sky. You can override that, but it, it does that. Um, and that's, you know, that's what, that's what's needed there. And then it, of course the red dot here in the sky track will move across and, and draw a line of where the sky, uh, or where the satellite was. It's a feature I'm going to add that to also have the prediction there to where it expects it to be. Haven't added that feature yet. And then the fourth mode is pass playback. So I said we can record the audio of these passes. When you go into the playback mode, it will play back that audio, but it will also play back all the things on the screen. Uh, your transmit and receives your, um, you know, where the satellite was in the sky at any given time, what the frequencies were, all that fun stuff will be played back in real time as you're listening to the audio. So, hardware. What hardware have I built? You've seen several pictures already, but let me give you a small history. This all started as a very last minute bring a hack project to Maker Faire 2017. This was a board I put together in, I think, a weekend. I designed the board in a weekend, sent it off to have it fabbed, brought it back, assembled it in like two days. There were many problems with the audio part of the circuit that I had to bodge over here you can see missing components and some wires going across things and it, it was a disaster i never actually bought any of the um bandpass filter components over here so i just jumpered from the output of the module to the rf connector this project itself i got it up on a repeater i said yay it works like i got the power and ground wrong on the i squared c bus this version one hack was a hack and it it sat on a shelf for years it was always in the back of my mind as a project that I wanted to work on when I had the time. And earlier in 2021, around September, my employment status changed and I had the time. And I started working on version 2. So version 2, was 2.1, uh, uh, was the prototype hardware that I've been doing all of my development and testing on. Uh, it started out as a pile of breadboards and individually fabricated boards and some, you know, pre-made boards. Like this is a pre-made GPS module. There's a pre-made dummy load. There's a display on a breadboard. Um, this is a very early version of the RF board with a couple of modules on it and some pre-made filters. There's a Teensy 3.5. I started out using a 3.5. There's a power supply section, right? So like this is a hacked together, breadboarded proof of concept of the project and it worked. I was flummoxed. I'm like, holy cats, this thing works. All right, let's keep building it. Um, so I, I had to iterate on some of these boards a little bit and I ended up with a kind of a four inch by four inch stack of three boards. The top board is the UI board. It's got the display, the knobs, the buttons, uh, a couple of WS2812 NeoPixels up here, although those have been removed on the final product because I never ended up using them for anything. Um, so this is what the user interacts with. The second board down was kind of the digital and audio board. Uh, the microcontroller is on here. It's right behind this, this RJ45 connector here. All the audio processing is here. This is the push to talk. That's the headset adapter. 
uh, and it you know sends digital signals up to the UI board, and then it also sends um, audio and digital signals down to the RF board, which is the third one down at the bottom. You can see these little metal cans here. Those are the RF modules and some bandpass filters over here. And the RF board also has the power input. So it's got Anderson power poles, power pole of the world, and uh, can take anywhere between 9 and 30 volts input um, because it's a switching module. It's a switching power supply that brings it down to 5 volts. So whatever overhead you need to get it down to 5 volts, I think it's about a 2 volt, so probably 7 volts up to like 30 volts, I think is its maximum input. Anything in that range. So 13.8 plus or minus 15%, you're fine. Uh, so that's what the prototype version 2.1 hardware looks like. Uh, what have I got that's going to go to fabrication? The, the final device is not going to look like that. So the production hardware, it's still at the fabricators right now. I don't have any hardware to show you because it's Chinese New Year. I didn't get the, the order in in time for them to finish fabricating and ship it to me before Chinese New Year happened. They are off until Jan or, sorry February 8th. This is dropping on February 5th, so three more days, and then I have, um, they, they probably need another three days to finish fabrication and ship it to me, and then however long it takes to get here from DHL. So I'm hoping middle of February, I will have my first version 2.2 boards um, ready for me to start putting together. But I do have drawings and pictures of what it's going to look like. So this is the multi-layer board uh you know layout from KiCad. the green is the bottom layer the red is the top layer the purple and yellow are the middle layers there's also copper pores on all four of those layers but this gives you an idea of the complexity of the radio of all where all the signals go what has to talk to what to make all of that happen all those three boards have all been squished and collapsed down into a single board and that's what that board is Here's a rendering of what that board looks like, what it's going to look like. You'll notice that most of it is just solid copper because I've got copper shielding on the top and bottom layers mostly, and then the middle layers are where the vast majority of the signals go. That's just kind of to shield everything inside the board. Um, this is going to slide into a metal case, an extruded aluminum case, which I don't have within easy grabbing distance. Uh, it'll uh, fit into an extruded metal uh, case, a Hammond case, and there will be the circuit boards on the sides that I use to enclose that. This is just one of them. Uh, this is the one over on the, kind of the right side of the radio, but you can see how it's got the cutouts for the different RF connectors for the 3.5 millimeter and for the USB on the microcontroller. And this is what the front panel is going to look like. Um, it's got a big cutout for the display, volume knob, an encoder knob, a couple of or a few buttons over here, power, PTT, and a back button. So between the encoder and the back, you can navigate pretty much any window or any menu system. And then it's got these five programmable function buttons. Um, and PF buttons in this case means that the, their function is dictated by whatever's on the display. There's a little icon down at the bottom of the display that says what that button does right now. Uh, and the function, the, the function of each of those buttons changes over time. Okay, so I've described what it is going to do in the first version, uh, but I am thinking farther down the line of what kinds of things I want to add. I'm going to disclaim now, none of this is a commitment. I am not promising to do any of these features, but I am giving you a heads up of what the kinds of things I'm thinking about. So we've got audio going in and out, you know, in from the radios into the microcontroller and then out from the microcontroller into the radios. Um, you know, so that's bi-directional. The microcontroller has access to all of the audio on the radio, which means that we can do any audio modulated mode, audio, modul audio modulated of FM, I don't know how to word that, anyway, a mode where you're sticking audio tones into an FM radio, right? Like packet. So we can do a uh, packet or APRS on the device itself without any external hardware. We can, all, we can do it all inside that micro. The Teensy 4.1 has plenty of cycles to do this sort of thing. We could do SS, uh, SSTV decodes, possibly even encodes, right? Um, it also is capable of passing that audio out through the USB cable. 
the the Teensy is amazingly powerful on what profiles it can present to a computer on the USB cable. My intention is eventually to have it show up as a bulk storage device that uh, is just the internal flash SD card. So you can get all of the audio files on and off there. That's also how you update the TLE data. Uh, you hook it up to a computer. It shows up as a flash drive. You drag, you know, you download the newest uh, TLE files from Celeste Track, drop it on there. Boom, you're done. That's how you update the, the TLE data. Um, but I can also get the radio audio from the radio and to the radio to show up as a sound card on the computer. So now this can be a very simple FM radio that shows up on the computer as a sound card. Add cat control to that, and you've got a remote station, just like a flex radio or a um, 7300 or a 9700, right? We can do all of that in software. Those are just software features that I can add to the existing hardware. I also have ideas for additional hardware, things I want to add, I, I want to, you know, additional products I want to make that will work with SOAR, and also some ideas for future versions of SOAR. So let's go talk about those. The first one I kind of already mentioned is the targeting display on the boom, the antenna boom, right? So we're going to have, we can, we can output the azimuth and elevation data over a serial cable to the boom and um, stick a little microcontroller on there that's got an accelerometer and a magnetometer. It knows where down and north are. It can figure out everything else and help you point your antenna. I also want to make a lightweight azimuth and elevation, you know, two-axis rotor. Um, there are, you know, really powerful ones that are weather rated. Yesu makes one for outdoor use. But I haven't really seen anything that's kind of picnic table portable, right? Uh, something that you could set up on a table and have it just automatically position things. That's something I would like to get into. I also want to make a amp for the radio. The modules I'm using are only good for two watts, and after the insertion loss of the bandpass filters, they're down to about one and a half watts output, and the receivers could be a little bit more sensitive. They're going to be okay for satellites. I've used them, um, but they could be more sensitive. So an external amp or maybe a next version that includes an amp uh, to give us more output power and a little bit better sensitivity. And then far future, I am not promising this one anytime soon, I want to replace those FM modules with a narrowband SDR. Um, where we get you know RF in one side and INQ out of the RF section, and that INQ goes into the microcontroller. And at that point, we have any arbitrary modulation that we want that we can fit into 48 kilohertz of RF. Um, we could do single sideband, we could do CW, FT, whatever. Um, you know, there are all kinds of modes that open up to us at that point. Uh, that's going to take a lot of RF design and engineering. So that's a that's a very far down the road future enhancement that I want to do. But I wanted to share my ideas with you. That's it. That is SOAR. This is the secret squirrel I've been talking about for months. Um, let me know if you have any questions. Thank you very much for coming to my presentation. SOAR, Satellite Optimized Amateur Radio. You can learn more, maybe, at electronics.halibut.com slash SOAR. Um, my name is Mark Smith, N6MTS. I am at Smitty Halibut on Twitter. I am also the head cheese of Halibut Electronics Incorporated. We the the company is at Halibut Elec at on or at Halibut Elec on Twitter. Thank you so much for coming, and I will take whatever questions you have now. <laughs>